Well, hello there. I'm Nurse Mo, and welcome back to The Straight A Nursing Podcast, where I teach nursing concepts and share tips on how to thrive in school and at the bedside. So today we're diving into some pretty common questions that I get asked all the time about nursing school. So we're going to go through five common questions. And honestly, one of the reasons I love nursing students so much is because they're so motivated to do really well in school. My inbox, my Facebook group are full of questions from students who are about to start school and looking for advice on how to succeed and what to expect. So before we dive into that, let's take a quick minute for our listener shout out. And this one goes out to Carrie. And Carrie is a student in my boot camp. And this is what she had to say. The Crucial Concepts boot camp is the best. I highly recommend the dosage section because it breaks it down perfectly. I would have classmates try to twist the process up and confuse me, of course, doing their best to learn. But as long as I stayed true to what Nurse Mo taught, I was golden. 100% every test. I'm so grateful I found her. So Carrie, thank you so very much for sharing that experience that you had with Crucial Concepts Bootcamp, and I want to wish you continued success as you finish out your nursing school program. So Carrie is talking about my nursing school prep course, Crucial Concepts Bootcamp, which if you are listening to this episode in real time or pretty much around the time that it is released, it's on sale right now. I'll put a link in the episode notes. And then just a quick little caveat, I think I'm coming down with a cold. So if I sound a little weird and a little nasally, that's why, okay? But I didn't want to miss getting this episode out to you on time. So we're just going to do our very best. Okay, so looking at these five really common questions about nursing school, a lot of these came from my Facebook group. So if you're looking for a really supportive, really positive Facebook group of nursing students going through the same things you are, then I will put a link to that in the episode notes, or you can just go onto Facebook and search for thriving nursing students. Okay, so I really hope to see you there. So question number one, this comes up a lot. Students ask, How do I feel confident in nursing school? So the first thing that I want to tell you about this is that you're definitely not alone if you're worried about your confidence or feeling less than confident either in school or as you head into school. A lot of students deal with a lack of confidence. And in many students, this may manifest as imposter syndrome, which is that kind of unwavering belief that you just simply do not belong in the position that you find yourself in. Maybe you feel unworthy or unqualified to be in nursing school or heading into your nursing school program. And I've talked a lot about imposter syndrome. If you go back and you listen to episode 69, I dive into it in a lot more detail. But one of the things about imposter syndrome, I really think a lot of it stems from simply having this overblown idea of what others' qualifications might be and misreading other people's confidence that they exude as proof that they're qualified. And if you're sitting over here feeling not so confident, then that must mean you're not qualified and therefore you don't belong. So 100% none of that is true, by the way, and you'll understand that when you go back and listen to episode 69. Imposter syndrome is your brain telling you a bunch of lies, just FYI. But when we're looking at confidence, confidence is something that is felt, right? It's something that you own and you also can exude that. We'll talk about how to feel more confident in just a moment. It's also something that is perceived by others. So I can tell you, honestly, without a doubt, people think I have a ton more confidence than I actually, actually have. And it's 100% based off their perception relative to the way that I present myself. And I can also tell you, I suffer massively from imposter syndrome as well. So when you're thinking about confidence and Wanting to feel more confidence in yourself, 
Think about someone in your classes, maybe in your prereqs or in your nursing program, if you're in a program now, and think of someone that you perceived to be really confident and therefore really competent, like you thought for sure that person has their stuff together. This is that person that if you saw them at nursing school orientation, you'd think, oh yeah, they definitely belong here. So taking a moment, thinking about that person, what exactly about their persona led you to believe that? Let's say that you know nothing about their grades or how well they perform on things or anything they've done in the past. You only are looking at how they presented themselves. So what were those things that made you think, oh yeah, they've got it together. They look so confident. I wish I could feel that way. Maybe was it that they seemed just super organized with their paperwork, with their notes, things like that? Did they appear calm? Before going into an exam, did they look calm when they walked out of the exam? You know, the opposite of that would be that student that's cramming madly before the test and then, you know, maybe just visibly upset when they leave the room. Did they speak up and ask questions in class or answer questions in class and get involved in the dialogue? Did they have confidence with the way they looked? Were they neat and tidy with their dress and their appearance? Or did they look like they just rolled out of bed? Did they pay attention in class, sit up straight, look engaged, make eye contact with the professor, take notes? Or did they waltz in late with their iced coffee, scramble around for a pen, stare at their phone during lecture, or chat with their neighbors? So you can see how those two things are kind of giving an opposite impression. So thinking about all of these things, and there's probably others, that made you perceive that this other person was confident, even if you knew nothing about how they actually felt. When you think about those things, aren't those all things that are completely within your control? So here's the thing. When you begin projecting an aura of confidence, guess what happens? You start feeling as if you are more confident. You may still suffer from imposter syndrome a bit, but you're not going to let it run your show, okay? You'll actually start to display the behaviors of someone who does have their stuff together. And this goes a long way toward reducing stress and anxiety. So here's what I want you to do. Act as if. Act as if you are feeling confident, as if you are feeling competent for nursing school. Now, don't confuse confidence with overconfidence or cockiness, which is that attitude that says, I already know everything. You have nothing to teach me. I couldn't possibly make an error. No, those things are unhealthy. Those things are not going to serve you and are actually going to be Harmful. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about confidence as a student who is eager and motivated to learn and who believes they are capable of learning. So you're going to act as if. So start by writing down five ways or a few ways that you can display confident behaviors. And you know what? These behaviors become your confidence practices. And if you do the things that a confident student does, you become that person. So you might be driving. Please do not write while you're driving, but be thinking about it. And then you can jot some notes down once you're somewhere safe. But some ideas might be showing up five to 10 minutes early for class so that you're prepared and ready when class begins. Sitting in the front row, a super simple thing to do. Leaving your phone in your bag during lecture so you're not even tempted to glance at it and you can stay engaged. Maybe it's having a system for organizing your digital files so you can always find what you need and you're not wasting time or scrambling around. With that said, maybe it's also organizing your paperwork, having your notes organized, and always having what you need in your backpack, right? Simple things. It could be avoiding getting bogged down in gossip or negative talk amongst your cohort. You might set a a boundary with yourself that you're going to avoid cramming right before an exam. 
You might want to practice accepting feedback in a healthy way. Maybe even for you, it's turning off distractions while you're studying. So all of these things would be confidence practices, things that a confident and competent student would do. Now, confidence also comes from actually possessing the knowledge and knowing what to expect in unfamiliar situations, right? Anytime I'm in a situation where I am not familiar with what is going on, I definitely feel way less confident. So that's why students who go through my Crucial Concepts boot camp say they went into their first semester with vastly more confidence as well as less anxiety and less stress. They knew what to expect and they knew some key information about some really important things like how to study, how to take notes, some foundation nursing concepts, how to be organized, how to do dosage calculations, what to expect from nursing school exams, and even how to tackle writing assignments, things other students struggle with initially. My students that go through boot camp already have these things figured out and can instead spend time on learning the material. So again, if you're listening as this episode is airing or in that general time frame, Crucial Concepts Bootcamp is on sale. I will put a link in the episode notes so that you can check that out. Okay, so question number two is, can I work full-time while going to nursing school? And students also simply ask, can I work while going to nursing school? Is it possible? So my answer to this is sure. Some students work while in nursing school. Some students actually work full-time while in nursing school. And it's really going to vary a lot and depend so much on how your school schedules things and what your work schedule might be. What I have seen with the full-time working students is that they will often work like a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday Most often on night shift, not always, but Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they get in their three 12-hour shifts as a CNA, a patient care tech, certified nursing assistant, whatever it's called at your facility. And that's how some students are able to do that. Or maybe they're working phlebotomy or something like that. Now, this will only work for students who don't need a ton of sleep and who have stellar, like beyond stellar time management skills and already have fabulous study habits, okay? So I would say that's the exception, not the norm. Most students work a little bit or not at all. So when I'm talking to students about, are you going to be able to work? How's your schedule? It really helps to do a bit of nursing school math. And if you would like to get a little calculator that I made in a Google spreadsheet, go to straightanursingstudent.com forward slash calculator. And it's going to go through and ask you all these things. And we'll talk about what some of these are in a moment. You punch in the numbers and it basically says, this is how much time you have available each week. Okay, so it's pretty cool. And it really helps you visualize what a time commitment nursing school is, but also there's all these things that you have to do for your life to keep your life running that also make demands on your time. So when we look at a week, okay, let's do a little bit of nursing school math, I call it nursing school time calculator math. When you look at a week, you've got seven days, right? You've got 24 hours a day in those seven days. That's 168 hours that you can use however you like. Well, let's say you plan to sleep seven hours a night. I would advise more, but let's say seven hours a night, pretty common for a nursing student. That's going to give you 119 hours remaining, kind of in your bank account, if you think of your time as a bank account. Then you look at how many units you are in, or how many hours rather that you're in class and clinical each week. Let's say you're in class and clinical 15 hours a week. You're going to be left with 104 hours remaining. And then it is advised that for every credit hour that you are in school, so if you're taking a 15 units, that you study two to three hours for every credit hour. So that three-hour mark is for those heavier science classes. So I consider all of nursing school heavy science classes. So if you are in 15 units, that's what you're enrolled in, plan on three hours for each unit. So 15 times three, 
you're studying and doing homework assignments and projects 45 hours a week. You've now got 59 hours remaining in your bank account. And then start going through all the things like, for example, how much time you spend showering, getting your hair together, your clothes on, getting ready every day. Let's say you're super fast at this and you do that in 30 minutes a day. Well, now you've only got 55.5 hours in your bank account. And then your commuting time. This can vary widely. Let's say school's not too far away for you. You commute for 30 minutes Monday through Friday. So 15 minutes there, 15 minutes back. Okay, that's very conservative. Most students probably do more, but just for an example, that's two and a half hours a week. Now you've got 53 hours remaining in your bank account of time. And then you take into account things like meal prep, grocery shopping, household maintenance, laundry, cleaning, paying bills, checking your email, checking your mail, all of those things. Now maybe you're down to about 44 hours a week remaining. And then you don't want to forget your health and wellness physical activity. Let's say you're shooting for kind of a minimum of 30 minutes a day. That's three and a half hours a week. So now we're down to 39.5 hours a week. We haven't even done anything with our job that we might have. And so if you had no other commitments on your time, You could possibly work full-time, 36 hours a week, again, depending on your school schedule and where things land in the week. This would be for that student who is basically got surgical-like precision with their time management. And if this student worked 36 hours a week, which is kind of like what's considered full-time when you're doing three 12-hour shifts, this individual would have three and a half hours remaining for the whole week, basically as wiggle room. And that comes down to about 30 minutes a day of wiggle room. That's not much. That does not let you plan for anything unexpected. Okay, so that would be the example for a student who has no other commitments, but a ton of students are parents and have kids of varying ages, which take a lot of time. So I put together this calculator for you so that you can go in, plug in all your commitments, all your things, your sleep schedule, your work schedule, all of that, and figure out really how am I going to make this work with nursing school. So again, go to straightanursingstudent.com forward slash calculator, and you can get your hands on that. And then question three is really related to what we just talked about with how much time it takes to do nursing school is how do you get everything done? How can I improve my time management? So The intensity of that nursing school schedule is pretty legendary, but even then, I don't think students really understand the time commitment and how intense it is until they're in it. I used to say, there's just no words to describe what it's like to have that much going on, that many assignments to do, that much studying to do, that much reading to do, et cetera, until you're actually in it. It's a lot. And when students can't really plan for that or understand it, it sets them up for maybe not being so successful. Because if you're not preparing for that, you're probably not developing solid time management systems in advance. And then what happens is students get mid-semester and they start to flounder. And I have said many, many times, success in nursing school is about 50% or more how organized you are and how good you are at time management. So if you're mid-semester and you don't have solid time management skills, you're not organized, This is not the time to be trying out new things and figuring out a time management system and an organizational system because you're already going to be absolutely buried and feeling the heat. Now, I wouldn't say don't try to figure those things out, but it's way more ideal if you can do this before your classes start. So I do go through this in detail in boot camp, but the key thing that I want you to understand here is that you absolutely must have some method of tracking all your to-do items and keeping track of your schedule completely set up 
and in place and a part of your daily and weekly habits before classes start. So if you're starting school soon and up until now, maybe you've been able to kind of fly by the seat of your pants when it comes to your schedule. I got to tell you, it's time to ramp that up. The key thing here is to use some kind of a planner. Now, you can use a digital planning system. You can use a paper planner. You can do a hybrid system. The important thing is that you use the heck out of it and that you have really good habits around using it. After going through nursing school, I actually created a planner that worked for the way I organized my time. It has to-do lists. It has time-blocking spaces. It really does help a lot of nursing students stay on top of their schedule. I'll put a link to that in the episode notes so that you can check that out. It's the Straighty Nursing Planner. If you did a Google search with that, you would probably find it in our Etsy shop. So anyway... When you're planning your schedule, I don't care what kind of planner you use. Of course, I think the one I make is great, but I don't care if you're using one you make yourself, one you buy at Target, one that you use online like Google Calendar. You have to get into this habit and this routine of using it. That's the absolutely key thing. So the first thing I want you to do when you're planning out your schedule is you have to know your big due dates for the semester. Get those in the calendar. Get those in the calendar from day one. You want to know your exam dates and your project due dates and big skill checkoffs, those things, okay? Because you're going to spend a lot of time preparing for those in advance. And then you want to put in all your class times, all your clinical days, and And you'll see, kind of like how we did the math in that last question, you'll start to see how your schedule begins to fill up as you go through the week. And then Sunday nights before classes on Monday, set aside time to look at your priorities for the upcoming week. And maybe, you know, if there's a bigger project like two weeks out, looking at those. But for the most part, focusing on this week, your priorities for this week, and block out the time in your calendar when you are going to get those things done. It's not enough just to have a list. A list doesn't tell you that one task is going to take 45 minutes and another is going to take four hours. You have to block out the time. And that way, you can see when everything is going to get done. And if you're managing your time really well, what you'll see is that, yes, everything will get done. And that takes so much stress off. How many times have you talked to a student or heard a student say, I don't know how I'm going to get all of this stuff done? If you're using time blocking, you know how you're going to get it done because you've already planned out your time. That takes a ton of stress away and really makes you a time management genius, okay? And the other important component of getting everything done and mastering your time management is knowing what to say no to. I call these things time thieves. For me, these are things like large study groups, email. Oh my gosh, how long can I spend on email? Social media. That is one of those things where half an hour goes by before you can even blink. Even things like household chores, while some of them are necessary, maybe some of them could be delegated to someone else or just ignored for a while. These things take away your time. And the other big thing that steals your time is multitasking. Multitasking is actually just task switching from one thing to the next. It's highly highly inefficient and wastes so much more time than if you can just do a simple focus session to get one thing done at a time. Okay, so those are my tips for time management. Question number four that I get asked a lot from students is how to study for their med surge class. So if you're going into nursing school and you're not sure what that is, Med surge, it might be called something else. I think in my program, it was called nursing care of adults. But basically what you're looking at is the medical and surgical care of patients 
with various disorders. And it's like your big daddy class, right? It's probably four, maybe five, even six credits. It's a big class. It's a lot of material to learn. The textbook is really intimidating. It's huge. Your lectures could be potentially very long. And a lot of students just feel overwhelmed, even just thinking about their med surge class. It's actually the most interesting class that you'll probably have. And you'll have two levels. Most likely, um, this will be broken into two levels for you, uh, a basic med surge and then an advanced med surge. So what I advise students to do is use my latte method because a lot of times students just aren't sure where to focus when they're studying or when they're looking at something that's brand new. So if you use the latte method, and if you've listened to my podcast for any length of time, you're familiar with this already, but I'll talk through it in just a moment. But this is a way to start training your brain to the things that a nurse needs to know. Okay, your book you're never going to know everything in that textbook. It's thousands of pages long. It's a ridiculous expectation for you to set that for yourself, okay? You're not going to know everything in that book. I want you to know the most important things and be able to think in the way that a nurse thinks so you know what to look for and what information to pull out from lecture or to pull out from clinical or to pull out from a case study, okay? So that's what the latte method focuses on. So before we get into the latte method, there's like a pre, there's like a pre latte component where we look at the pathophysiology. Just be able to state the pathophysiology of a disease condition in two to three sentences. Okay. You don't have to get super granular, but have a basic understanding of what is going on pathophysiologically for this disease condition. Okay. And then you get into the latte. So L stands for look. How does the patient look? And I don't just mean what can you notice with your eyes. What do, It's what do you notice with all of your senses. As a nurse, you're using your eyes, your ears, your hands, your nose, um, what the patient says, what the patient sounds like when you listen with your stethoscope, things that you notice about them. So basically kind of the signs and symptoms of a disease condition. When you walk into a room and you're coming on a patient with asthma, what do you expect to see for somebody who has asthma, right? What do you expect to notice? You're going to be noticing wheezing, increased work of breathing, some anxiety, things like that, right? So what are the signs and symptoms? What do you notice about a patient who has this disease condition? And then the A is for assess. What are your specific nursing assessments for a patient with this disease condition. This could be things like, what are you listening for? What are you feeling for? What are you watching for? All of those things. What are you focusing in with your assessment? And then the first T is for tests, knowing what tests are conducted so that you can then go and look them up in the medical record to see what their lab results are, for example, what their pulmonary function test revealed, et cetera, whatever that is for that disease condition. You need to be able to determine what diagnostic tests, what ongoing tests are used to not only for the physician to diagnose the condition, but for the team to monitor the patient's progress, hopefully as they get better, or to be able to catch things when they worsen, okay? So that is tests. And then the next letter is another T, and that's for treatments. What treatments are provided for a specific disease condition? Is it going to be antibiotics or corticosteroids or some other kind of maybe a surgical procedure, whatever that is? How is this condition to read it. And then E is for education. What key education components are you going to be sharing with the patient, with their caregivers, with their family, so that they understand their disease conditions, so that they understand the treatment plan, so that they can manage their disease condition once they're discharged, whatever that may be. So that's LATTE. Look, assess, test, treatments, education. And that, in a nutshell, is what is going through you know, the nurse brain as you're working with patients in the clinical setting. Okay, so that is how I like to structure studying for med surge. It really helps you hone in on 
what does a nurse need to know? And then the other question that kind of dovetails off this, so I guess this is kind of a bonus question, is how do I study for peds? How do I study for maternal, newborn, and mental health? Well, guess what? Those are all just subsets of med surge. They're just specialties of med surge. So you can use the latte method for all of these other classes. Okay, so if you have not yet experienced the latte method, you can just go back. You can look for a a recent episode. If I'm talking about a disease condition, most likely I am presenting it to you using this framework. So I will put a link in the episode notes so that you can get your hands on a latte template, and that can really help guide your studying. Okay, question five. How do I deal with an instructor who just stands at the front of the room and reads me the PowerPoint slides one after the other? So a lot of students have asked this, you know, dealing with an instructor who maybe isn't the most engaging, who maybe doesn't have the most interesting lectures, and maybe the student doesn't feel like they can learn effectively with that teaching style. So first of all, the sad part of this is you're not going to change the way an instructor teaches overnight. Sure, you can 100% submit your end of semester evaluation, and I always encourage students to do that. Be fair in your evaluation, but if you have constructive feedback to share, share that. If the instructor did something you found helpful, share that so that they can keep doing the things that are working and pivot on the things that aren't working. Most of the time, I would say 99% of the time, instructors really want to do a good job and that feedback can really help. But they're not going to change overnight, right? That's not going to help you in the moment. So what can you do as the student? What I tell students in this situation is you have to take ownership of your education. If you're in a lecture where the instructor is just reading PowerPoints to you and that's it, I, 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 I agree. That's not very engaging. I would say, what can you do to make this a more engaging experience for you and how you learn? So the first thing I'm going to ask if you come to me with this question is I'm going to say, well, what kind of questions did you ask in class? And then I'm going to ask, and did you then go to office hours? And I can tell you, most of the time, students are like, uh, and there's a lot of silence after that because they're not speaking up and asking questions in class. They're not going to office hours. So what I would do, if I've got an instructor who is not teaching in a way that is super engaging to me, is I'm going to speak up. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to ask clarifying questions. I'm going to ask for further explanation. I'm going to ask for a patient scenario example. I'm going to ask a what if type question, like what if I'm in clinical and my patient's blood pressure drops suddenly? What should I do? What should I be looking for? What should I be asking? Lots of times when you can start applying things to clinical scenarios, to patient situations, when you start asking questions of the instructor, they're probably not going to be nearly as boring. They're going to get more engaged and you're going to get so much more out of it. So that would be the first thing, asking questions in class. If you don't understand something or the way they explained it caused confusion, you got to get in there. You've got to ask questions. You've got to take ownership. And then Go to office hours. If office hours are available, go there. Get that one-on-one, or maybe there's a few other students there, and you can all ask your clarifying questions there and get a little bit of extra teaching, okay? So you have to take ownership of your education at all times. And then I would advise you to stay engaged. Find a way to stay engaged with this really boring lecture as much as you can. Take notes. Jot down questions that come up for you as you listen. And if you're not sure what notes to take because you're just so disengaged with this lecture, print out that latte template and fill that out as you sit through the lecture. And if you find that this type of lecture just makes you feel more confused, maybe, or you feel like you just aren't learning much from it, are you doing the pre-reading before class? Now, I'm not saying do all the reading. I, I basically tell students don't do all the reading because you probably don't have time. But I do teach students a way to skim read 
before class so that when you go into lecture, you're not going into it completely blind. And that can really help. I call it like priming the pump. You prime the pump and then you go into lecture and you're way more prepared to learn. Other students will watch the lessons in my med surge solution program before they go into class. This is a really quick, most of the videos are 15 minutes and teach an entire concept in 15 minutes, which your instructor will talk about for three hours. I'll teach you the key things to know in about 15 minutes. It's going to give you that great overview using that latte framework. And then that way, when you go into class, you've primed that pump and you're more primed to learn, even if the lecture isn't the most engaging. And then you can ask even more in-depth, even more thought-provoking questions so that you can really get the most out of that one-on-one time with your instructor. So there you have it, some five common questions that I get asked about nursing school from students who want to thrive, and that's probably you too. So if that sounds like you, I would love for you to join my Thriving Nursing Students Facebook group. I'll put the link to that in the episode notes. Check out Crucial Concepts Bootcamp. Check out Med Surge Solution. Check out my planners, get that latte template. I'm going to put all the links to those resources in the episode notes. You can also go to straightynursingstudent.com and probably find those things pretty easily there as well. If you go to the everything page, everything that I offer is kind of summarized on that one page, kind of handy. So you can check that out there. So I will see you back here next week where I will be sharing with you some things to know before your first clinical day. So I'll see you back here next week for that. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.